Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this series of presentations this evening on race, law, and history. This is the third in a series of events that's been spearheaded by the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities Race and Resistance Network. And it has been organized with the cooperation of the Center for Justice. What makes this event different from the other events that have been uh, organized in the past is that it's designed for members of the bar to explore the theme of racial justice within the context of Bermuda's legislative and judicial history. The 400th anniversary year of the permanent establishment of courts here is an appropriate time to reflect on race, law, and history in Bermuda. From the perspective of the courts, at least, this story which must be told is of a journey in search of a promised legal land, a land inspired by a vision of non-racial justice, a land which has ne neither been pursued at the speed of light nor at the speed of instant messages. It is a tale I should stress at the outset, not told by an erudite legal historian, but by an earthy legal tradesman who occasionally likes to putter in the garden of practitioner scholarship. According to my version of the story, the judicial travelers have overall made steady, albeit sometimes halting progress towards that idyllic legal land, which is watered by a spring of pure and undiluted non-racial justice. I would decline to follow for present purposes the somewhat cynical view of new world social progress offered by Max Romeo in his popular reggae song, One Step Forward, Two Steps Backwards in a Babylon. <laughs> Before beginning the story proper, however, it is necessary to explain how I conceive the issue of race to be relevant to the judicial function of the courts and why I consider non-racial justice to be still an ideal which has yet to be realized. Why do I suggest that in 2016, the courts are still journeying towards an ideal of non-racial justice? The view that human rights provisions uh, serve a non-legal function of setting ethical standards has been persuasively put by the economics philosopher Amata Sen as follows. Proclamations of human rights, even those stated in the form of recognizing the existence of things that are called human rights, are really strong ethical pronouncements about what should be done. Legislating to create human rights protections and to prohibit human rights infringements is an important concrete and finite step, but it does not guarantee that the protected rights will in practice be respected fully or at all. Indeed, the courts are given the vital role under our legal system of enforcing the legal protections against human rights abuses, including discrimination on the grounds of race. In today's legal terms, most discussions of race and the law are shaped by 20th century human rights provisions in international conventions and national constitutions designed to prohibit discrimination on various grounds, including race. This modern approach of prohibiting multiple grounds of discrimination in a holistic fashion is apposite for the judicial perspective of race and the law. All forms of discrimination based on the uh, personal characteristics of litigants ought to be shunned by the Bermudian courts because equal treatment is central to the modern judicial function. The British derived judicial oath reads as follows. I do swear that I will well and truly serve Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors, uh, and will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of Bermuda, without fear or favor, affection or ill will, so help me God. The need for judges to be sensitive about the multidimensional nature of discrimination is today well recognized. Canadian Chief Justice Beverly McLaughlin has eloquently described this aspect of the judicial function in the following way. Justice must always be delivered in a responsive manner, one that takes account of the social context and different perspectives of those who seek it. Justice must also be delivered in an impartial manner, one which is free from prejudice or false assumptions about cultural difference. In a world marked by pluralism, the judge must become the one who understands every voice. <laughs> 
Any historical review of race and the law, no matter how superficial, must not only have regard to the wider backdrop of discrimination as a whole, it must also take into account the extent to which, at various points in history, the concept of equality before the law was defined and recognized, not just locally, but in the wider world with which Bermuda was most closely involved. It goes without saying that in a new world society with a history of both slavery and segregation, the law at one time did not consider even overt racial discrimination to be as offensive as we consider it today. The need for judges in a society such as Bermuda to be mindful of socio-legal history was perhaps best expressed in a Caribbean context some years ago by the now Dean of the Faculty of Law at UWE, St. Augustine Trinidad, Rosemary Bell Antoine, as follows. Just as the study of the English common law must examine the historical evolution of that law, so too must, our, so too must the study of West Indian law appreciate the birth of our own law grounded in slavery and colonialism. The Caribbean man and judge has an active role to play in reinterpreting the legal framework to build a more indigenous and just society. The Bermudian judiciary's journey in pursuit of the ideal of pure justice is a story which can conveniently be divided into three chapters, the pre-emancipation period, 1616 to 1834, the post-emancipation period, 1834 to 1968, the post-1968 constitution period, 1968 to 2016. Assuming I do not run out of time. <laughs> Bermuda began its life in constitutional terms as an appendage of Virginia. The island was legally created or constituted by amendment in 1612 to earlier royal charters granted by, the, by King James I to the Virginia Company. The Virginia Company sold its rights in Bermuda for 2,000 pounds, great bargain, to various London merchants who returned the islands to the Crown in return for the grant on June 29, 1615, of letters patent to the Governor and Company of the City of London for the plantation of the Summer Islands. All the King's subjects who migrated to Bermuda and their children born there were granted all liberties, franchises, and immunities of free denizens and natural subjects within any of our dominions to all intents and purposes as if they had been abiding and born within this our kingdom of England or in any other of our dominions. As far as possible, the courts established were required to apply English law, and in the case of mutiny or rebellion, martial law is applicable in England by a jury of 12 men. Bermuda legally began as an English settlement whose residents included non-English people, regulated under a constitutional system which only formally recognized the liberties of English subjects, and only fully English men. In the first 100 years of the court's existence, persons of indeterminate status not only included all women, African slaves, Native Americans, Irish, Scottish, and Welsh indentured servants, who were often prisoners captured in the wars which created the United Kingdom, were all people of indeterminate legal status because of their race or ethnicity broadly defined. The constitutional order which legitimized legal discrimination on racial grounds was from time to time subjected to vigorous challenge, but the rule of law under a flawed constitutional order always prevailed. There would be a number of conspiracies during the pre-emancipation era aimed at overthrowing the established order which were foiled and often prompted explicitly racial legislation aimed at preventing rebellion by slaves and free coloreds. How, one must ask, did the courts operate in practice during this era? On June the 15th, 1616, the Court of General Assize first sat in St. George's. Various orders were made in civil cases. However, the first criminal jury trial also took place after an accused man was charged uh, and pleaded not guilty. In uh, CFE Hallett edited Butler's History of the Bermudas, the first formal jury trial in Bermuda is described as follows. Uh, this is a, a translation into mod modern English. The original version is, is not so easy to suggest. Soon after the departure of the Pinnace Edwin, the assize at St. George's began, where there were only a few matters of importance to deal with. 
The jury consisted of 12 men, selected by a haphazard mixture of martial law and the law of England, and a discredit to both systems. But one case arising was that of a man by the name of John Wood, who was arraigned and condemned. He was an abject, hopeless, and open-mouthed open Frenchman, who in a drunken state had spoken cheekily and arrogantly to the governor. Wood was arrested and charged with mutiny and rebellion, put to trial, and sentenced by the person who had been appointed judge. The governor himself never took on the role of judge, as he was well aware of his own incompetence in that respect. <laughs> the condemned man was hanged some two days after the trial. <laughs> Clearly, not only did free speech have its limits, <laughs> the principle that justice delayed is justice denied was given what now seems overly zealous recognition. A cursory review of sentences imposed by the courts in the pre-emancipation era suggests, perhaps unsurprisingly, that English male citizens were treated far more leniently for criminal infractions than were persons of indeterminate legal status. Somewhat surprising is the fact that even though special measures were taken to deal with serious rebellions, even slaves were afforded the right of being tried in a court of law by a jury uh, in, in ordinary cases. Uh, more surprising still is the discovery that courts comprised entirely of white Bermudian men were motivated to dispense justice in a fair manner. On the 5th of June, 1730, Sarah or Sally Bassett was sentenced by the Chief Justice to be burned at the stake during a period when various slave owners were being poisoned by their slaves. She had been convicted by a jury of 12 in the Court of General Assize three days earlier. However, on June 4, 1730, Beck, another female slave, was found not guilty of poisoning by a jury of 12 white, presumably slave-owning men, despite the fact that seven white witnesses and one slave gave evidence against her. Was the same jury which had convicted Sally Bassett two days earlier um, was it the same jury who convicted Sally Bassett two days earlier, and did they feel that one conviction was enough? Court records reveal several instances of the death penalty not being carried out in respect of slaves, typically in response to emotional pleas by their owners. There are also interesting uh, instances of judicial dissent. For instance, at the December 18, 1672, 72 assizes, the court by a majority ordered that notices be posted for the return within 15 days of a runaway slave, Black Jack, after which period he could be shot. The governor and secretary of the council, sitting in a judicial capacity, dissented from the second limb of the decision. It is unclear, a cynic might interpose, whether this dissent was based on concerns for the life of Black Jack, the property interests of his owner, or the rule of law. An unambiguously liberal and impressive dissent occurred on Christmas Eve, 1673, when Sir John Hayden, Cornelius White, and Thomas Leecraft were in a minority who voted against summary execution after stigmatization and whipping for several Negroes presented to them by ye grand inquest as guilty of a dangerous plot. Although the majority decision apparently prevailed, the governor, with Mr. Leecraft concurring, suggested that, as no blood had been shed, the leading conspirators should be branded with the letter R and the rest whipped and sent home. Secretary White voted for trial by a petty jury, presumably believing that even slaves should be permitted due legal pro uh, process. There was, unsurprisingly, no apparent attempt in slave-owning Bermuda to follow what possibly uh, would have been viewed as the morally valuable but economically catastrophic English human rights precedent of Somerset's case decided by Lord Mansfield's Chief Justice. Uh, Mansfield, intriguingly and coincidentally, was at the time raising a black great-niece, Dido, dramatically portrayed in the 2013 film Bell. On 22nd of June, 1772, Lord Mansfield gave a pivotal uh, ruling which helped to inspire the abolition movement throughout the British Empire and also contributed to a tidal wave which would eventually roll onto Bermuda's shores. Uh, 
The egalitarian spirit of that movement was reflected in one pre-emancipation case in particular. An act to ameliorate the condition of slaves and free persons of color was passed in 1827, which made free colored Bermudians and slaves competent witnesses before the court, but did so in discriminatory terms, requiring them pro produce certificates of good character, a requirement not applicable to whites. Chief Justice James Christie Eston, in opening the Assizes on November 4, 1827, suggested that it would be extraordinary that the highest standard of co conduct should be exacted from a class of persons whose servile condition, either actual or past, must have had a tendency more or less to debase them in comparison with whites, and that of, of two persons, the one white or notoriously bad, the other colored, not of generally good character, the first should be admitted as a legal witness and the last repudiated. All laws should ha have a reasonable construction, and I think it would be reasonable to take the words generally good character in a lower sense, as applied to persons who are either actually slaves or who have recently emerged into freedom from a servile position. Eston, as a lawyer at the turn of the century, had defended John Stevenson, the Irish Methodist minister convicted of preaching to slaves in violation of an act, passed shortly after his controversial arrival in Bermuda. Eston, impressively but unsuccessfully, had raised freedom of conscience as a defense, possibly advancing the first explicit human rights argument in Bermuda's legal history. In 1825, while still Chief Justice, Eston donated the land upon which slaves would build the Copps Hill Methodist Church. Thus, even before emancipation, when the courts were still required to work within a constitutional framework which formally sanctioned racial discrimination, Bermuda produced a leading lawyer and senior judge willing to adopt a creative and activist approach which favored non-racial justice. The 1834 Emancipation Act not only ended slavery, but also ended the era of explicitly racially discriminatory legislation. Little mentioned uh, is the fact that the Number Two Act of 1834, in complementary terms to Number One, guaranteed equal access to the law without regard to race. This implies that not only was slavery itself limited to persons of African descent, but that even free people of color did not enjoy equal rights before the law. Looking at the provisions of the 1834 Emancipation Act No. 2 through 21st century lens, it is difficult to understand how or why policies of racial segregation were subsequently introduced at a precise point in history which it has not been possible to identify without being challenged for contravening the equal rights provisions of this landmark legislation. Was the act forgotten? Was it studiously ignored, assuming its terms reflected its short title and that it merely provided for the liberation of former slaves? The Emancipation Act No. 1 was enforced in the Enterprise case in 1835, which will be addressed by another speaker. It remains for other researchers to identify any other notable case or cases between 1834 and 1968 when non-racial justice became constitutionally protected in modern terms where the courts were required to consider the legality of the racially discriminatory practices in relation to access to facilities, uh, employment, and the disposition of property by will, which undoubtedly existed through much, if not all, of that period. But perhaps the courts of Bermuda can take credit for the progressive pamphlet published in London by then retired Chief Justice James Christie Eston in 1837 and sent to uh, uh, the governor, council and assembly, a plan for the religious, moral and general instruction and the beneficial management of the concerns of the emancipated people of color of the Bermudas. The apparent silence of the courts on racial discrimination which was arguably prohibited by the Emancipation Act No. 2 for over 150 years, serves to illustrate an important point. Noble ideals enshrined in written or unwritten laws mean little in real world, world terms unless they are either reflected in voluntary human conduct or given vitality by lawyers and litigants enforcing human rights protections in the courts.
Under the Bermuda Constitution Order 1968, the Bermudian courts were given, for the first time, the power to administer justice within a legal framework under which all legal Bermudians were formally equal before the law. Section 12 of the Bermuda Constitution both prohibited Parliament from enacting laws which discriminated on the grounds of race and prohibited the application of any laws in a discriminatory manner. The Human Rights Act 1981 prohibited discrimination in relation to employment, accommodation, the disposition of property and access to other services. Indirect racial discrimination perpetrated through the property vote was finally dispensed with. Voting rights and access to public offices, including juries, were available to all without regard to property status and indirectly race. Was this not nirvana? The route to the promised land where pure non-racial justice flowed like milk and honey was now impeded by very few obvious constitutional obstacles. The Constitution itself blessed parish-based boundaries which gave greater weight to each vote in small, predominantly white constituencies, notably Paget, when contrasted with the weight of each vote in large, predominantly black parishes, such as Warwick. This anomaly was effectively removed by the creation of single-seat constituencies of, as far as possible, equal size through amendments to the Constitution introduced in 2001. On the other hand, the 1970, in 1971, the Juries Act was amended to create a new form of special jury trial apparently designed to produce indirectly predominantly white juries. This represented backsliding in both philosophical and practical terms, but the legislative measure at least deployed the subtlety of approach which Bermuda's 1968 Constitution demanded. Yet even this blot on the legal landscape was removed in late 2004 following the recommendations of the Justice System Review Committee chaired by Justice Norma Wade Miller. Ignoring for present purposes the embarrassing omission from Section 12 of the Constitution of sex or gender as a prohibited ground of discrimination, racial equality before the law today is substantially guaranteed at the constitutional level. One peculiar defect remains. Section 12.2 prohibits applying any law in a, in a discriminatory manner, but subsection 6 provides as follows. Nothing in subsection 2 of this section shall affect any discretion relating to the institution, conduct, or discontinuance of civil or criminal proceedings in any court that is vested in any person by or under this constitution or any other law. Having regard to Bermuda's distinctive legal history of applying the criminal law in a manner which discriminated against people of color on racial grounds, it is difficult to fathom why the Crown should, in effect, be given constitutional permission to deploy the prosecutorial discretion in a discriminatory manner. Bermuda's courts are today well equipped to grant relief in respect of racial discrimination in a society in which the descendants of slaves are now a clear majority. Equality before the law in racial terms is substantially protected by Bermuda's Constitution and the Human Rights Act 1981. The courts ought no longer to be directly implicated in applying the law in an explicitly discriminatory manner. Indirectly, the courts are implicated in administering the criminal law in a manner which engages men of African or mixed African descent in the role of criminal defendant to a disproportionate extent. A racial group which comprises roughly 60% of the resident population uh, or 70% of the Bermudian population constitutes nearly 100% of the prison population. Why this is so is essentially a socio-political question. Is racial discrimination occurring in the delivery of public services or in access to social and economic opportunities? Is racial discrimination occurring in ways which cannot be challenged through legal action? These are questions which a judge is not qualified to answer. Fortunately, the cadre of lawyers willing and able to bring human rights to, to life through legal action is stronger than at any time over the last 400 years. It is to be hoped that no legally actionable wrongs are being ignored. The courts, however, are not only required to enforce legal prohibitions on discrimination, Judges must avoid discriminatory behavior when dealing with all cases which come before the courts. In 2006, Chief Justice Richard Ground published a code of conduct voluntarily adopted by Bermuda's judiciary, Guidelines for Judicial Conduct. 
Paragraph 62 provides, judges must conduct themselves with courtesy to all and must require similar courtesy of those appearing in court. Judges should be alert to protect parties or witnesses from discourtesy or displays of prejudice based on racial, sexual, religious, or other impermissible grounds. It would be naive to suggest that any New World ex-slave society has consigned all traces of European-dominated racism to the historical dustbin. However, Bermuda can be proud of the progress that has been made by both the courts and the country as a whole over the years. But before policymakers, social activists, and interested citizens settle into a blissful state of smug self-satisfaction, perhaps we should ask an important question. If race is slowly moving off the legal stage, what is taking its place? Class or wealth, gender, language, place of origin, religion, sexual orientation? In sharing this reflection this evening, I've chosen to reject the famous observation of the German philosopher Hegel. Rulers, statesmen, nations are wont to be emphatically commended to the teaching which experience offers in history. But what experience in history teaches is this, that people and governments never have learned anything from history or acted on principles deduced from it. Lawyers trained in the English common law tradition have always had a love of history. Some would say such lawyers have an excessive fascination with the past at the expense of an active and creative engagement with the present. But common lawyers, at their best, look back at judicial precedents from the past and seek to extract general principles which have enduring value and to both apply them in the present and commend them to the future. And so, in this spirit, I conclude as follows. Looking back over Bermuda's 400-year judicial journey towards the land of non-racial justice, three important lessons may be learned. Firstly, the rule of law, however imperfect, has always prevailed, despite the most challenging of circumstances. Secondly, the courts, reflecting Bermuda as a whole, have for many years displayed a perturbing capacity for accommodating inequality before the law. The third historical lesson is that we can learn from history, should we choose to study it with the activist aim of applying its lessons today and tomorrow. To keep our footing on the next leg of this judicial journey, we can hopefully look back and see how our forebears stumbled on their way, and perhaps how we are stumbling in different but not wholly dissimilar ways today. Race matters, as Professor Cornell West has so powerfully argued in the United States context, where the legal challenges faced by the descendants of slaves as an ethnic minority are far greater than the challenges faced by the, their Bermudian ethnic majority counterparts. Former Commonwealth Secretary General, Guyanese-born Sir Sridath Ramphal, looking at the underpinnings of racism more broadly, has persuasively identified the process of othering as the common strand which facilitates much of man's inhumanity to man and woman. He has reflected that in today's multiracial cities, and I would add islands, it is all too easy to become alienated from one's fellows, to perceive them as strangers, transforming them into others from whom we can justify withholding what Wilberforce so well described as that equitable consideration and that fellow feeling which are due from man to man. Fortunately, reflecting on race, law, and history from a judicial perspective, the court's route map to the land of pure non-racial justice is comparatively simple and clear, even if the route promises many twists and turns along the way. Judges are required by the judicial oath to do right to all manner of people. Bermudian courts must ultimately be guided by a disposition and by an approach which is aptly captured by columnist Suniti Maharaj commenting on a human rights law reform call reportedly made last month by a judge in Trinidad and Tobago, a sister New World ex-slave society. She wrote, recently wrote, ours is a very fragile culture of rights which is not surprising given our history in which the very right to humanity was denied. People are naturally afraid that in the coalescing around one particular issue, 
we might end up excluding or devaluing another. It could happen. That is why we cannot discriminate between rights or elevate one above the other. Rights are rights are rights. On the 11th of February, 1835, the Enterprise, uh, an American brig, sailed into Hamilton Harbor. It had been sailing between Virginia and South Carolina and had been, had been blown dramatically off course and ended up off the coast of Bermuda. Its cargo was 78 slaves. They were almost all young and they had all been born or raised in the USA. What followed is one of the most inspiring moments uh, in the in Bermuda history, certainly when it comes to the interplay of race and law. Richard Tucker, a black businessman, and the real hero of the story, applied for habeas corpus on behalf of the slaves. The ship tried to leave, uh, but was prevented. And on the 18th of February, 1835, the slaves were landed at Bars Bay and escorted by jubilant crowds uh, up to the courthouse. There, in a late night sitting, Chief Justice Butterfield informed each of them that they were free and asked them individually if they wished to remain in Bermuda. The vast majority, 72 of the 78, said yes. The tragic exception, a Mrs. Ridge, decided to take herself and her children back to South Carolina and thus back to slavery. Um, she had other children in the slave states and so faced a terrible Sophie's choice, freedom, or abandoning her other children to slavery. No one knows what happened to Mrs. Rich. She dis disappears entirely from history. However, in the courthouse in Hamilton, there were emotional scenes. The Attorney General, uh, Mr. Darrell, organized a whip round uh, for funds to help the newly liberated slaves. The mayor of Hamilton, Mr. Cox, offered up his warehouses as temporary accommodation. But it was Mr. Tucker, uh, through his friendly society, a, an early form of NGO, who apparently took all, uh, full responsibility or real responsibility for looking after Bermuda's newest arrivals. So the liberation of the enterprise uh, led to a great deal of local celebration and emotional scenes. It also created an international incident. There were angry press reports in American media angry speeches on the floor of the US Senate. Indeed, the senator for South Carolina, uh, Mr. Calhoun, suggested in 1840 that if there were any repetitions of the Enterprise case, it would lead to war with Britain. So, uh, Bretton Hamilton, in 1835, it was a moment of euphoria locally. Uh, so, is the Enterprise uh, a, an example of Bermuda landing a blow for universal human rights? The answer is in part yes, but there is a darker context. The answer is yes, because the liberation of the enterprise slaves is an example of the common law's antipathy to slavery, an antipathy which must be celebrated. The enterprise litigation did not involve any novel questions. There's no reported decision. There's no report of the Chief Justice even uh, uh, having any, indulging any legal debate. He, he was certainly not creating a precedent. He was following one. Indeed, this was not the first time, in practical terms, of American slaves being freed in the British colonies. An American ship called the Comet had been wrecked in the Bahamas in 1830, and the slaves had been freed. Chief Justice Butterfield was also applying well-established legal jurisprudence. In, uh, in 1772, this is a case the uh, Chief Justice uh, referred to in his uh, talk a few moments ago, uh, Lord Mansfield, the Chief Justice of England in the case of Somerset and Stuart, had ruled that the common law simply did not recognize slavery. Somerset and Stuart, like the Enterprise case, uh, involved habeas corpus. Um, it was a, uh, a case where uh, Mr. Somerset was a slave who had arrived in England from Virginia and then uh, was forcibly put on a ship to go back to Jamaica to be sold for apparently upsetting his owner and a writ of habeas corpus was filed on his behalf. In the resulting decision, and it involved some of the leading advocates of the, of the age, the decision itself is 10 pages long, which is extraordinary for 1772. Lord Mansfield's ruling was uh, short, but rightly celebrated, and he said as follows, and I quote, the state of slavery is of such a nature 
that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political. It is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. And by positive law, he meant statute. So what Lord Mansfield was saying was that as far as the common law was concerned, slavery was not recognized. It had nothing to do with the common law. It was an odious creation of parliaments. And further, what was not said in the Somerset and Stuart case is almost as important as what was said. Put another way, the parameters of the debate are as important as the decision itself. For the argument from the bar in Somerset and Stuart um, and Lord Mansfield's ruling from the bench were colorblind. The ethnicity of Mr. Somerset was legally irrelevant, the African origins of no legal consequence. And we can contrast this uh, with American jurisprudence from the same period. The Supreme Court decision of Dred Scott and Sanford, 1857, was a stain on the reputation of America's highest court. And the Chief Justice, uh, Chief Justice Taney, is now only really remembered for his um, appalling ruling in that case. And the facts in the Dred Scott case were simple and resonate with the Enterprise and the English case of Somerset. In Dred Scott, uh, an American slave, Mr. Scott, applied to the federal courts to rule that he was free. He had spent years in a free state. So how could he be both free in one state and a slave in another? In contrast to Somerset and Stuart, and in contrast to the Enterprise, the ethnicity of Mr. Scott was all important. It was pivotal to the American decision. According to the Supreme Court, if you were black, you could not be a citizen of the United States. According to the Supreme Court, men and women of African descent were not citizens and thus had no standing to complain about slavery, let alone do anything about it. This racist decision was a catalyst for the outbreak of the American Civil War in 1861, some four years later. But in Bermuda, in 1835, we had celebration, not violence, because the English common law did not recognize race as legally relevant. The barrister for Mr. Somerset, to go back to the English decision in 1772, the barrister for Mr. Somerset had argued in, um, that England's heir, this is a poetic phrase often used in the debates at that time, that England's heir was too pure to permit slaves to exist. The reason for the jubilation in Hamilton in 1835, after the Enterprise decision, was that Bermuda's heir was being pronounced clean. There is, however, a darker side. Chief Justice Butterfield reached a decision based squarely on ordinary English common law principles which had been set down for many years now, in particular by Lord Mansfield. He was applying common law notions of liberty of subject. But the simple fact is that if the enterprise had entered Bermuda's waters some six months earlier, uh, he would have done nothing because slavery, as we all know, was alive and well in a, until August 1834. There's plenty of positive law um, under, uh, in existence underpinning the institution of slavery. Indeed, prior to 1834, in comparative law terms, Bermuda was noted for its singularly repressive slavery regime. William Wilberforce's Society for the Abolition of Slavery, again, the, the chief referred to the um, Wilberforce and his pivotal society a few moments ago, had this to say about Bermuda in, an, in a report dated 1825. And I quote, of all the West India islands, the laws of Bermuda are among the harshest and most opprobrious. There is a wanton severity in their legislation which is quite singular. And the report cited not just the usual um, statutory provisions which underpin slavery, for example, the uh, impunity, which is uh, give grants to slave owners who kill their slaves, but referred to in particular the legislation which prevented uh, liberal, uh, liberation or manumission of slaves. Anyone who attempted to liberate their own slaves was subject to large fines. And indeed, free blacks were prevented or banned from owning any real property or you know, um, um, you know, real estate, or indeed entering long leases. In short, just six months before Enterprise's arrival, Bermuda was certainly not a safe haven. The air was anything but clean. Second, we should recall that the abolition of slavery was not homegrown. Abolition did not come from Bermuda's parliamentarians. 
The Emancipation Acts of 1834 were not uh, due to the uh, good intentions of our Parliament. Abolition was imposed by Westminster. Like the enterprise, abolition was an import. The Emancipation, uh, the emancipation Acts of 1834 were mandated by the Westminster, the English Abolition of Slavery Act of 1833. It was a, a, a colony-wide. Uh, third, while the new arrivals were embraced and abolition celebrated in 1835, the consequences of abolition were certainly not embraced in their entirety. The property bar for voting was raised in 1834 in the Emancipation Acts as part of a package of local measures dealing expressly with abolition. It was part of the same package, um, the, same, the same statutes. So the ruling elite would be protected from the new demographic. The enterprise slaves were free, but they would not be voting. In short, in 1835, there was freedom for the new rivals, but certainly not equality. There is a rather um, sickening footnote as well to the, to the enterprise, which is, you may be aware of, it, but it's, uh, you may not, and it's slightly less well known. Uh, Britain was in 1853, following an international arbitration, ordered to pay damages to the enterprise's insurers for wrongfully liberating the enterprise slaves. For international law in the, at that time recognized slavery, and according to international law, Chief Justice Banner Butterfield's decision was made entirely without jurisdiction and was simply wrong. He should, according to international law, have applied American slavery laws. Thus, all 72 of the new arrivals should have been sent on to South Carolina to, uh, to bondage. For a ship on the high seas, sailing under a country's flag, is and was considered an extension of the flag country. A ship forced to enter local waters due to bad weather is, under international law, to be treated as if it was still on the high seas. So, uh, in other words, the enterprise should have been treated by Chief Justice Butterfield as still in American waters, and thus uh, the Chief Justice Butterfield got it wrong. So Britain was ordered by an arbitrator to pay $17,000 compensation to the insurers as reparation for this breach of international law. But in 1835, Bermuda fortunately ignored, wittingly or unwittingly, and it's probable it was completely unwitting, uh, it ignored its international obligations. Uh, Bermuda followed the English common law, and Bermuda began to breathe cleaner air. The, there was a very long history and intimate connection between our legislation and racial considerations. Uh, ben just concluded by speaking about the increase in the franchise qualification in the aftermath of emancipation. There was a deliberate decision to make it more difficult for blacks to be able to vote and even to stand for office. The rationale for this was advanced by James Stevens, who was the undersecretary for the colonies, who said that this is a deliberate decision that we embrace in the UK or in England because we'd rather see change come about gradually rather than an abrupt change in power relations. So there was a very explicit consideration given to this legislation as it was put into operation in the immediate aftermath of emancipation. The second explicit piece of legislation in the post-emancipation era dealing with race was in 1842. Because then Parliament, dealing with what was now a majority black country, Parliament, parliamentarians were very concerned about this racial ratio. And so a bill was tabled in 1842 to encourage emigration to these islands from England. So clearly in 1842, uh, almost 10 years after emancipation, racial considerations were still very much in the minds of those who had power to bring about change. The third piece of not legislation, the third policy change that would have an impact on legislation 
was in the 1920s. In the 1920s, Governor Wilcox, who had recently uh, come to Bermuda, he was very concerned that we had a majority uh, black police force. He felt that it was inappropriate in a country with a large white population and a large number of white uh, visitors, tourists, it was inappropriate to have a majority black police force. And he tried to encourage the parliamentarians to increase the number of whites in the police force. You can find all this in the uh, confidential dispatches of the governor uh, in our archives. Or you can read my book, and you'll see it in my book. <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to do, I, I'm told, right? Um, In an effort to accomplish this goal, the parliamentarian said that, well, uh, whites don't want to join the police service, the police force, because the pay is inadequate, the working conditions are inadequate, so we need to address that. So parliament addressed that by increasing the pay and increasing the uh, conditions. And they sent the police commissioner to London to find 25 suitable police officers. These 25 suitable police officers came in the early 1920s. And for many years, that picture was proudly displayed at the police headquarters up at Prospect. And then when I started talking about it publicly, the picture disappeared. And <laughs> I've been asking Dwayne Keynes, Dwayne Keynes to try to find that picture, because it's an important part of history. But he says it's, it's gone, so we can't find it. But hopefully it'll, it'll turn up one day. So in the 1920s, you would now get a majority white police force that was designed to enforce the laws. So here you see a connection between the police force and the implementation and enforcement of our legislation. So it's very, clear, very clearly the case. And then we're going to have a conversation later on about the suffragette movement. But one of the reasons why the old male parliament opposed women to getting the right to vote is because they thought it would lead to what they called other extensions. They didn't specify what they meant by the other extensions but it's very clear to some that it meant the vast majority of the people who were denied that vote, uh, which were black uh, adult residents uh, in Bermuda. So let's fast forward to the last 50 years where we see, I think the Chief Justice referred to the potential of us moving toward Nirvana and the, the era of post-racial uh, legislation. Well, unfortunately, <laughs> the legislation just became somewhat more sophisticated in its, in its delivery because the racial connotations were still very much there in the uh, 1960s. The most explicit manifestation of this was the creation of our electoral system. Many of you will know that up until, the mid, until 1963, we didn't have a um, dual seat electoral constituency. But in a period of the move toward universal suffrage where everyone got the right to vote, the parliamentarians created an electoral system which the very framers of that system identified as being completely inspired by race. If you, you go back and read the parliamentary record, you'll see a member of parliament, uh, F.C. Mizik, who said that we have contrived an electoral system which will guarantee 16 white seats in our electoral system. Very explicit. The uh, framers recognized that they had failed to create a post-racial electoral system. And so in Bermuda, at a period when we were moving toward a more democratic society, we were enshrining in our very political structure, our very political framework, a racial set of structures or policies. Alongside that, we also amended the Election Act. And the election laws allowed for anyone who was a British subject, resident in Bermuda for three years or more, will get the right to vote. Seems relatively innocuous, but then you have to consider how immigration policy changed. Between 1950 and 1960, the net migration to Bermuda was about 800. Between 1960 and 1970, the net migration was about 8,000. And all you have to do is compare the 1950, 60, and 70 uh, census reports, and you'll be able to see that. The vast majority of these people who came in the 1960s were British subjects, and most of them were white. 
and therefore we were able to vote after being resident for three years. So you see the confluence of a contrived electoral system with a voting rights provision that had a clear racial dimension that led to a lot of political discussion and dialogue. It was raised at the 1965 conference. That uh, legislation which allowed British subjects resident for three years to get the vote wasn't amended until 1979. It wasn't appe repealed until 1979. But everyone who got the vote retained that vote. No one going forward will be able to have the vote. So what we see is a system in which racial considerations, political power, and legislation have a long, intimate connection. Chief Justice doesn't sound much like Nirvana. Uh, it, mean, it means that we still have a lot that we need to do. One of the most important changes in our electoral system came when we abandoned the, uh, the old electoral system and it went to single seat constituencies. I suspect that Bermuda is the only country in the world that has had dual seat constituencies. What country moves toward a democratic system and allows two people to represent an electoral district? Why would that be the case? But then you go and look at what happened. Because in every area where it was deemed to be a marginal or close call for electoral purposes, the ruling party ran a black and a white candidate to show racial harmony. In every area where it was clearly the case that either it was a vast majority black or vast majority white, only two, candidates, two, two black candidates or two white candidates ran. So you can clearly see the political considerations in the creation of the dual C constituencies. That was abolished <coughs> in the early 2000s. And so too was the provision that required that an electoral district be contained within a parish. As the Chief Justice already mentioned, that contained within itself a fundamental bias because parishes were of quite different demographic makeups and that led to the 16 safe seats that Mizik and others referred to in the early 1960s. The um, final piece of legislation that I want to refer to is one that is currently in place that seems to many to be relatively uh, innocuous, even progressive. But the impact of this legislation is that it has a significant uh, pertinent effect when it comes to racial, uh, um, uh, the racial impact. And that is the Job Makers Act. The Job Makers Act currently, and I'm sure others can advise that this is not the case, my assessment is that the Job Makers Act is the only provision in place today which allows for anyone to acquire a permanent resident certificate status in this country. There was a provision, of course, for those who were here before 1989, but the um, Job Makers Act is currently the only provision that allows for that. So the only route to a more stable, secure position in Bermuda other than status is through the Job Makers Act. The Job Makers Act is very particular. It refers to those who hold senior positions in companies. If you were to examine the demographic of that category of employment, you'll see a very um, singular dynamic. They tend to be wealthy, they tend to be white, and they tend to be male. Well, there is no provision in our Constitution to prevent gender discrimination. But our Constitution does say that any law which has the effect of treating people differently, either negatively or more positively, is a violation of our Constitution. The Job Makers Act provides for a pathway to PRC status for a very select group. It doesn't allow for the pot washer who's been here for 30 years to apply for it. It doesn't allow for anyone else who's not in a senior position to be able to apply. So it's, it's a very single uh, demographic. And given our sensitivity about race, it is a matter for examination. I'm here in a room full of lawyers. So I'm hoping that 
the mayor politician that I am, I know the Chief Justice referred to Hegel and how politicians don't often refer to or embrace history. Well, I embrace Marx more than I embrace Hegel, and Marx is going to have turned Hegel on his head. So I actually see an intimate connection between politics uh, and history, and you can't separate the two. But in a room full of lawyers, I think uh, if we are all becoming uh, more sensitive to issues of race and the legislation, then I think it merits attention. Uh, we need to decide in 2016 what kind of laws that we want to have on our books. Do we want all our laws to pass the test of being non-racial in both their design as well as their impact. Um, now, if I was at an academic session, purely academic session, I know that I would have two or three opinions, but given that I'm sitting with a room full of lawyers, I expect there'd be a multitude of opinions about much more, than, much more so than two or three, but I think it is an issue that merits uh, discussion. I want to thank uh, Alexa for bringing this forum uh, to the legal fraternity. And I hope that we will have a, a full uh, deliberation about the impact of not just the history of racial discrimination with regard to our laws, but also about the current impact that certain of our laws have at the level of race and our social dynamics. Thank you very much. The emphasis of my talk tonight is going to be social justice rather than the law. Having just said that, I would like to begin with the Bermuda Constitution as a starting point. The Bermuda Constitution emulates the principles espoused by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the European Convention on Human Rights, namely that human rights are inalienable regardless of race, creed, or religion. When it comes to examining the effect or impact as they relate to racial justice and equality, it is important to remember the aims and objectives of the Universal Declaration and the European Convention. Both instruments followed the Second World War, so the main concern at that time was political and civil rights, meaning the protection of fundamental rights of the individual from the state. Equality before the law was and is deemed to be the backbone of a free and democratic society. Those ideals were and are good. But when it comes to racial justice and equality, any legislation that emulates principles of equality before the law presumes a level playing field. The abolition of slavery in 1934 and racial dis desegregation in 1968 did not create a clean slate. The emphasis being equality, we have achieved that in law, as you have heard this evening, well, except for what Walton had to say, but we have perpetuated inequities in society. The difference between equality and equity can easily be shown in our criminal justice system. On their face, our laws are fair and impartial in their appearance. They are colorblind, but in effect, sometimes they are not. One such example is the stop and search powers under section 315F of the Criminal Code Act. The police have the power to stop and search people and vehicles under various pieces of legislation so long as there are reasonable grounds for suspecting that they are carrying, for example, stolen goods, drugs, or weapons. We take no issue with those provisions. Under section 315F, as amended in 2010, if an inspector above reasonably suspects that serious violence may take place in any locality or that dangerous weapons may be carried out in any locality, he may give authorization that police officers may stop and search any person or vehicle. The police officer is not required even subjectively to reasonably suspect that the person or vehicle he is going to stop and search is about to engage in an act of violence or is carrying a dangerous weapon. The constitutionality of this provision aside, this legislation has had a disparate impact on the black community. According to statistics released by the Bermuda Police Service, stops and searches jumped from 3,720 in 2009 to 9,419 in 2010, 
and to 17,429 in 2011. Based on the data released by the Bermuda police, over 90% of those stopped and searched were black. What these statistics did not reveal was the impact and perhaps unintended consequences of Section 315F on the black community. As a result of those powers, the magistrate's court were flooded with young black males who had been stopped and searched under 315F, ostensibly because that locality had been authorized for such searches in order to prevent violence or seize weapons but they weren't in court for that. What we were told by the defense power was that these young men were being prosecuted for offenses other than what Section 315F was intended to be used for. And of course, this meant a criminal record and of course, the infamous stop list. St Statistically, the Bermuda police were unable to show a correlation between 315F stops and searches and seizure of weapons and arrests of violent crimes. We have more clear statistics in the United States. In a 2002 national survey on stops and searches broken down by, re by race and ethnicity, that is white, black, and Hispanics, the data collected showed that equal number of and I repeat, equal number of whites, blacks, and Hispanics were stopped by the police. Of those stopped, less than 4% who were searched were white, whereas over 10 and 11% of the blacks and Hispanics were actually searched. Criminal evidence found on those searched was completely in reverse. Of those searched, less than 44% of the blacks were in possession of something illegal, whereas over 12% of the Hispanics and over 14% of the whites were in possession of something illegal. We have interesting statistics from the UK as well. But before I turn to those statistics, I should pause to mention um, the case that Chen referred to um, in his opening. That case involves Section 6 60 of the UK Criminal Justice and Public Order Act of 1994, which is identical to our Section 315F. And that case went all the way to the, pre, uh, to the Supreme Court. Lady Hale, whom we all know and respect as um, very liberal, had this to say. There are great benefits to the public in such a power. It is the randomness and therefore the unpredictability of the search which has the deterrent effect and also increases the chance that weapons will be detected. The purpose of this is to reduce the risk of serious violence where knives and other offensive weapons are used, especially that associated with gangs and large crowds. It must be borne in mind that many of these gangs are largely composed of young black people from black and minority ethnic groups. While there is a concern that these groups should be disproportionately targeted, it is members of these groups that will benefit the most from the reduction in violence, serious injury, and death that may result from the use of such powers. Put bluntly, it is mostly young black lives that will be saved if there is less gang violence in, Lon in London and some other cities. It is important to bear in mind, as Lady Hale urged us to do, that statistics show that her observations do not accord with reality. In July 2013, I'm sorry, in July 2013, the UK Secretary of State for the Home Department, Theresa May, announced that of the more than one million stops and searches performed on the basis of reasonable suspicion, on average only 9% resulted in an arrest. The UK Metropolitan Police said in 2014 that it was able to increase its search to arrest ratio to one in five at the same time it, it has discrete, I'm sorry, decreased the number of random stops that it carries without reasonable cause. In other words, the rate of legitimate arrests have increased where the police have done their job and first assessed whether there exists reasonable grounds to stop a person before doing so, rather than relying on his race. 
Statistics tell us part of the story, but not all of it. The social narrative reveals the other part of the story. I used to think that with a combination of statistics and data and anecdotal evidence, we would be able to advance racial justice. Sadly, my experience with Section 315F over the last few years has proved me wrong, partially wrong. Clearly, statistics are important, but they're not enough. So long as we don't address some basic core beliefs that we have as a society, we do have a long road ahead of us. I'd like to pause here for a minute so I can provide some context to what I've just said. Section 315F, Stop and Search Powers, was the very first issue that Center for Justice decided to address. At our very first board of directors meeting, I mentioned that a young black male had come to see me a few months earlier. He had been stopped nine times over a 13 month period. This young man had a bachelor's degree and a full time job. Nothing about this young man, how he dressed, how he looked, how he spoke, projected an image of gang type behavior, yet he had been stopped nine times. What I learned from my talks and speeches and private conversations about Section 315F powers was that when it came to police powers, the reaction to it was mixed. Blacks and whites in roughly equal numbers were divided on whether the police should have the power to do what they needed to do to stop violence versus the supremacy of our constitutional rights. But when it came to the story of the young black man who had been stopped nine times, the reaction of blacks and whites were completely racially divided. The blacks understood immediately that this young male fit a certain profile by virtue of his race. His character was never questioned by them. The whites, on the other hand, wanted to know more. How did he look when he was stopped? Where was he? What was he doing? Who was he with? One sympathetic listener sighed that it was unfortunate that he hadn't attended somewhere like Harvard because his story would then be more impactful. <laughs> Another perhaps less sympathetic listener observed that whilst this man's experience was unfortunate, he must have been in the system. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been stopped so many times. In Bermuda, police don't kill, fortunately. But when it comes to stop and search, the narrative is very similar of, if not identical, to that in the United States. And it now looks like in the UK as well. When it comes to an encounter with the police, meaning police brutality or killing or abuse of power, young black males do not have the benefit of society's doubt. We expect them to be perfect victims. Otherwise, they cannot be victims of police brutality and killing. And in the case of Bermuda, racial profiling when it comes to stop and search. Lady Hale's observations may resonate with a segment of society, but all they do is reinforce the assumptions that form the mindset that continues to divide the community. So statistics and anecdotal evidence aside, it is time that we address this mindset if we are serious about addressing racial equality. Thank you to the Oxford University Research Center and the Center for Justice for this opportunity. As I prepared for this discussion, it hit particularly close to home for me because on the 4th of February this year, I will have the opportunity to cast my vote in my constituency's by-election, Constituency 13. A civic duty that I had come to take for granted every four to five years is clearly something that did not just come to be. As I gave thought to voting and contemplated it in light of this talk, the question to, to be answered for me was, what impact did race have on the suffrage movement? And in turn, what impact did the suffrage movement have on race, if any? Following my research on this discrete point, which is limited at best, I conclude that there is not only an influence of race on the suffrage movement, but looking at the suffrage movement from the other side of the coin, it is safe to say that the suffrage movement impacted race in this country. There are three key points that are elucidated from this intersection. A framework is highlighted, a fear is apparent, and future groundwork is laid. <laughs> 
For the avoidance of doubt, the suffrage movement is one element of the overall women's movement, which I would submit continues today as women seek equality with our male counterparts. During the suffrage movement, women fought for the right to vote and to be engaged in the political process nationally and parochially. However, before I delve and unpack my three Fs of framework, fear, and future, it's necessary to set the contextual and chronological background of the suffrage movement. The women's suffrage movement and its subsequent impact in Bermuda dates back to 1848, where the first American women's convention in Seneca Falls issues a declaration for women's suffrage and equal education and employment opportunities. In the 1860s, Bermudian women were barred from the vestry, where in the Church Vestries Act 1867 specifically restricted the franchise to males. This will be relevant in due course with the Supreme Court case that sought to challenge this. Between 1869 and the late 1800s, three million women signed and made their desires known for suffrage to the British Parliament. However, approximately 120 years ago, here in Bermuda, in 1895, the suffrage movement becomes live, where the first petition was made on behalf of Bermudian women. 122 Bermudian women signed a petition which was presented in the House of Assembly. Anna Maria Outerbridge, a human rights activist, asks her father, Dr. T. A. Outerbridge, to propose the bill. The bill is tabled and it's passed in the House, but defeated in the Legislative Council. Moving to 1900, the women are denied the right to vote again as the Parliament Election Act was restricted to males only. In 1919, Sir Stanley Sperling, a champion of women's rights, urges the House to set up a committee to draw a bill on women's suffrage. Three years pass and nothing is completed. In 1920, our American sisters get the right to vote. However, in the background, there is a young woman by the name of Gladys Misick, later Morrell, Morrell, a Bermudian who was born in 1888 with strong ties to Somerset. She founds an organization called the Bermuda Women's Suffrage Society in 1923. She's charged with leading the cause for the women, and her efforts were in fact recognized at last year's National Hero Celebration. And her story can be found in the book, Gladys Morrill and the Women's Suffrage Movement in Bermuda by Colin Benbow. Ms. Morrill was one of the first Bermudians to go overseas to obtain higher education, and arguably it was her time in the UK that gave her exposure to the suffragette movement, which when she returned to Bermuda, brought with her the same desire for progressive changes. In 1925, attempts to grant women full parliamentary, municipal, and parochial franchises were defeated 24 to nine in half an hour. The two bills were brought by Sir Stanley Sperling, the Women's Suffrage Act 1925, and the Jury Act for Women 1925. In 1928, Morrill bought a test action in the Supreme Court, wherein she challenged the then Sands Parish Vestry, J.H. Patterson, for refusing her the right to vote. This case was Morrill and Patterson. The then Chief Justice, Rowan Hamilton, concluded that, quote, he was satisfied that women never possessed the right to vote at parish vestry meetings in Bermuda and consequently could not be nominated as vestry men, and that no such claim has ever been made. The defendant Patterson was technically successful and for the litigators in the house, he was awarded his costs, which the society paid. In applying more pressure, Morrill enlisted the help of UK suffragette Emmeline Pankhurst, who told Bermudians she was surprised that one of Bermuda's oldest colonies was sl so slow to extend equal rights to women. Arguably, that quote could be applied to other rights which are being sought. Where momentum seems to pick up is in 1930, when the women attend a parish vestry meeting, and when they were disallowed the right to vote, they refused to pay their parish taxes. Morrill and the other ladies held rallies and tea parties and letter writing campaigns, keeping in contact with overseas groups, and even holding a mock funeral to demonstrate the passing of justice which had been killed by men. <laughs> Sir Stanley tries to advance the cause again in 1931, and he is defeated again. Between 1935 and 1944, activity spurs the right forward when MP Henry Tucker, who would become Sir Henry, pilots the bill through the House on the 21st of April, 1944, with a vote of 20 to 13, and in the upper house, three to five, resulting in the suffragettes securing voting rights for all women, white or black, who owned property. In 1944, Mrs. Henrietta Tucker was honored as the first woman to vote in a by-election, and Ms. Edna Williams was the first black woman to vote in that by-election. 
1948, the first women were elected to the House, Hilda Aiken for Devonshire and Edna Watson for Paget. To date, Bermuda has had three female premiers and numerous women sit in the House. On its own, the progress of women in this country sounds good. But when you marry that with the social, racial, and political backdrop, one sees the challenge that this movement highlighted. The three points, of framework, fear, and future. The framework. On a very basic level, one has to remember the social context at this time, segregation. In countries where economic, social, and political power results in control, the way in which you limit this control is to put restrictions in place. While the chronology is descriptive and informative at best, it would be remiss not to mention and remind you that in order to vote in Bermuda, you had to own property of a certain value, which following emancipation would have been very difficult for a large portion of this community to overcome. As a result of this restriction, black individuals, lower class whites, and Portuguese in this country could not vote by virtue of their inability to own property of a certain value. This evil was particularly compounded when immediately following emancipation, the value of land needed to vote was increased by the parish vestry to the determined value of 60 pounds. Further, if you own land in more than one parish, you got more than one vote. So if an individual, land, if an individual owned land in multiple parishes, they could return vo votes for all four MCPs in the parish. This is a quote that one magistrate recounts that a man with land in all nine parishes placed his wife and all five adult children on his properties, which meant that they each had 36 votes in that they controlled 216 votes, not because they did not own the property, but because it was worth less than 60 pounds. To put it into perspective how skewed the numbers were in 1930, a survey by the Bermuda Women's Suffragette Society found that out of a population of 30,000 in Bermuda, where 36 representatives were elected, this was, the elections were made possible by only 1,400 people. This was extremely unfair and disproportionate. The majority in this number arguably would not have been blacks, lower class whites, or Portuguese. The framework in place at that time also identified the mindset of those in power who sought to keep the imbalance in place. The treatment that women endured during this fight was demeaning wherein their identity was besmirched. There were letters that were sent to England calling these women crazy. And one quote, which is my paraphrase, that was made to a woman during this time was, why do you want to trouble your heads with politics and such matters? We don't want to burden you. The apt reply from the suffragette was, well, if we deal with disgruntled men all the time, we can definitely handle politics. <laughs> the imposed restrictions of the day clearly tried to keep race and voting as separate and distinct. But the reality was you could only keep, keep these variables apart for so long before their inevitable in intersection took place publicly and resulted in social and political change. It should be noted that during the battle for the ballot, namely the period of 1923 and 1944, there is very little reference to blacks and their apparent involvement in this process. However, I would submit that Gladys Morrill knew that her work could not be limited to one class of women, for the concept of woman in and of itself is not homogenous. So when it was brought to her attention that there was a lack of involvement from blacks, general meetings were held at workmen's clubs, which historically was the hub of the black community. And as a result, it was said that the BWSS, quote, formed their own public pressure group across racial lines, end quote. In order to be effective as a movement, there had to be support from many in this country. There is no clear indication that black women were on the front line, but when women ultimately received the vote, Miss Edna Williams, a black woman, cast hers. While the research is limited on how involved black wor blacks were in the suffrage movement, the, flac the fact that a black woman voted is indicative of the knowledge that was shared in the community. This brings me to my second point, that of fear. Why was, the why was there a lack of involvement by blacks in this, in this movement? While there was little or no support from black property owners, quote, most of whom were too busy earning a living to have time to attend afternoon meetings. In an almost totally segregated island, Bermuda, both blacks, males and females were aware of the social and economic re repercussions that could follow unpopular political acts. But this did not deter Alice Scott from, from participating. Conversely, there may have been a fear from those who held, who held the power, the up, white upper class men. As Mr. Brown writes in his book, which you should all buy, Bermuda and the Struggle for Reform, Race and Politics and Ideology, 1944 to 1998, quote, 
The case studies reveal a white ruling class prepared to act boldly to defend or to advance its interests, while at the same time barely containing its anxiety about what it believed were imminent threats from below. The vote for bourgeois women was resisted, at least particularly because it might provoke the enfranchisement of the black masses. What this suggests is a ruling class whose members perceive themselves to be resting on a fragile hegemonic order, supported by a voteless, disorganized, and pliant working class, an order that would collapse if workers were empowered, conscious, and organized, end quote. Those in power knew that in order to maintain the status quo, keeping women disenfranchised would not rock the social order of keeping blacks, women, and Portuguese out of the political process and thereby allowing them to retain power. This brings me to my final point of the future. It's apparent that race played a part in the suffrage movement, as showing a unity across racial lines had an impact. But arguably, it was the suffrage movement that laid the groundwork for the universal movement. For as Nancy Astor, an Anglo-American, quoted, was quoted as saying when she was in Bermuda, if a color problem now exists, you must face it squarely. The general consensus from blacks is noted in, in the May 1944 recorder that, quote, although the colored people in the main seemed perturbed over the granting of women's suffrage, they had little to be thankful for under the old system. We are told that in the future, not only will matters be no worse for us, but a, a decided improvement is to be expected, end quote. A natural consequence of allowing women to vote was an impact on the future of this country. The Bermuda women's suffrage movement set the stage for another political development the 20-year fight for universal suffrage, where it was conducted that by black citizens who had wanted it and the abolition of the property qualification all along. As history unfolded, the freeholder vote happened in 1963, where all Bermudians 25 and older were eligible to vote. The plural vote was retained, perhaps an attempt to, to continue to control. In 1963, the same year, the first black woman, Dame Lewis, was elected to parliament. In 67, the first woman is elected to a municipal corporation. In 68, there is universal suffrage, plural vote is abolished, and the voting age is reduced to 21. And in 1989, the voting age is reduced from 21 to 18 years of age. So in conclusion, at the outset of the movement, there is a covert interplay between race and the suffrage movement. But in due course, the interplay became more pronounced and visibly impacted Bermuda. Looking at this intersection highlights the framework of the time, the fear that existed, and the future Bermuda, our present, which we have benefited from. The work has not ended, but continues to this day, as the women's movement continues to advance as we seek equality in political, social, and economic spheres. Race, class, and other variables will continue to play their part in the movement. However, these variables cannot operate in silos as was attempted in the past, for if the changes that need to be made for women are to take place. Thank you. Venus, what is the litigation solution to stop and search powers being disproportionately applied to black members of the population? I mean, is it just a question of going to court with a constitutional complaint? Do you have to collate evidence? Do you have to raise some money to bring the court case? Or is there a political solution where you just train the relevant police officers to stop people fairly? That's the question. You know, what, what's the solution to the problem, really? Thank you for asking that question. The problem with um, pursuing this through the courts based on racial uh, based on discrimination, is the kind of evidence that you would need. But the legality of that section can actually be successfully challenged based on a um, European decision in Gillen. Um, and so you don't have to kind of strike it out on the basis of its discriminatory effect. Um, I think it would just be easier to strike it out on the basis of the fact that it contravenes uh, two provisions of the Bermuda Constitution. Politically, um, unfortunately, we have clearly failed. We have campaigned for its repeal for the last five years, and there just is not political will for it. I would like to ask, seeing as the legal system operates against a cultural background, and seeing as you can't have one institution moving forward when clearly all the other institutions and the whole culture is, not, is determined not to move. 
what does the Bar Council intend to do to alter the dichotomy in Bermuda's social structure? And any of them can answer. <laughs> not specifically to deal with race or culture, but just looking at women's issues. Um, we've recently co-founded the Women's Legal Network, which is a space for female practitioners to come together to network, to educate, to create philanthropic opportunities, because although we're coming out of law school on equal footing with our male counterparts, when you look at the partnership um, levels, around the world, it's only 19% of women that are sitting at those tables. So although it may not specifically be um, racial issues or class issues, but dealing specifically with female issues that we encounter in practice, we've created a space for the female practitioners to do that. And there's been great response to it. The Bar Council has lent its support, the Bar Associ Association, sorry, has lent its support to it. And we're looking to continue that discussion. We have a think tank on Wednesday evening, so if you want to participate, please come and see me afterwards. Thank you, Jen. Uh, to the Chief Justice and this distinguished panel, uh, everything that you've said tonight has evoked huge numbers of questions. I was particularly taken by, Kim, your question, uh, by your observation that uh, why was there fear amongst blacks to uh, activate themselves in the uh, suffragette movement? Um, when it was in the interest of many black women to, to, to do so. I recall that Lord Pitt had said in his analysis that um, Bermuda rotates every 20 or so years, par par primarily uh, black, black needs for advocacy uh, does not take place. There is a fear operating until this bubbling or this panting up. And so my question is, how can we, Chief Justice and members of the panel, how can we accelerate responsiveness to, uh, and get rid of this fear so that we do advance through the nirvana uh, and have uh, pure air and good legislation uh, that isn't uh, discriminatory? How do we remove this fear so that we're not waiting 20 years, cycles for advancement? On the issue of, of gender, I would say that there is not fear. I think that there has not been a critical mass of, um, shall we say, individuals in this community <coughs> who believe that gender issues require significant attention. I remember when I was teaching at the college, I used to get, every year I used to get my students to write a paper, why is there no organized women's movement in Bermuda? And I would say, go and talk to the politicians, female politicians, see what they have to say. And without fail, Across party lines, the female politicians would say gender is not a big issue, without fail. This is throughout the 1990s. And so I believe that that discussion, I'm happy to see that there's a, a forum created, but there are a wide set of issues involving gender that never even get addressed. So we need to, we need to do that. I'm not sure there was fear back in the 1920s and 30s. I think that when you look at the... Um, who are the founders of the recorder? Um, the, the group that founded the recorder that emanated from the Jamaican, uh, Marcus Garvey, the Garveyites, the UNIA, the United Negro Improvement Association, they had a big presence in Bermuda. And there were women who were Garveyites who were actively involved in that quest for social justice. Um, but I think the, the women's movement, the BWSS, was seen as a bourgeois entity. It didn't capture the minds and the spirit of women back in, or black women back in the 1920s who suffered from segregation and oppression of, of a racial nature. So I think that explains it. I'm not sure I accept that there's a, a lingering fear today. I think it has everything to do with organizing and realizing the potential of the power that you have. I just want to say a few very quick thank yous. Thank you to all of our amazing speakers. Thank you to everyone who came. And I just want to quickly thank the um, professors at Oxford University who helped put this on. Professors Stephen Tuck, Elika Boma, Justine McConnell, Imabong Umaran, and Tessa Roynan. Thank you again for coming. Good evening. <laughs>